Thanks for watching this presentation on the implications of coral reef mining pits on 2D hydrodynamics. My name is Sebastian Klaver. This research is mainly relevant for small island developing states. These states are generally small in size and area, have a very dense population, such as the Maldives, which you can see on the top right picture, are characterized by a low average elevation, many of them only a couple of meters above mean sea level, and are generally very isolated in remote locations, in, for example, the Pacific Ocean. These factors result in limited resources for these states, both pertaining to financial resources and construction materials, and combined these make the islands extremely vulnerable to flooding and climate change. One of the solutions to the lack of affordable construction materials is to source granular and rocky materials from excavation pits on the island's reefs. These excavation pits are generally located on the island reef flats an intertidal area that can be several hundred meters in width. One can imagine that the presence of these excavation pits may have significant impact on the local hydrodynamic processes and potentially to more flooding. However, until a few years ago, this was never studied in detail. In 2013, Ford et al. carried out a measuring campaign in Majuro Atoll, the Marshall Islands. They found that the presence of a pit could leave a significant impact on nearshore wave heights and depends on the wave period. And this was followed by a numerical model study of the same reef by Yao et al. in 2016, who showed that pit width and cross shore location can impact the near shore wave heights. They also suggested that the presence of a pit can reduce wave amplifications on the natural frequencies of the reef's open basin structure. In 2018, I carried out my master's thesis with supervision of researchers at Deltares and TU Delft. I used a numerical model XBeach to generalize the findings of the two previous studies. The main findings of this thesis were expanded on and eventually published in 2019. The paper focused on 1D hydrodynamics, excluding any longshore effects that may be present on the reef. I will discuss some of the findings in this presentation. And recently, Yao et al. published uh, the findings of a laboratory study using 1D wave flume to complement and verify the findings of the above studies. These studies present a significant process in understanding, progress in understanding the impacts of excavation pits on reef hydrodynamics. However, currently no studies exist that assess the 2D effects of pits, which could in turn be used to assess impacts on local morphological processes, which are heavily affected by 2D hydrodynamic processes. This presentation will provide some preliminary findings on the effects that pits have on two-dimensional two -dimensional hydrodynamics. Wave processes on reefs have been studied in detail. To summarize, the main wave processes from offshore to nearshore are wave shoaling when the waves travel to shallower water, which increases the wave amplitude, wave breaking when the height comes too large, resulting in energy dissipation and energy transfer to different wave frequencies. And due to the presence of different wave heights and frequencies, the location of breaking of the reef at the reef crest oscillates back and forward in cross shore direction. This initiates the breakpoint forcing mechanism, which releases longer infragravity waves onto the reef flat. On the reef flat itself, there is further energy dissipation due to continued wave breaking and high levels of frictional dissipation due to lower uh, water depths. Moreover, there's wave-wave interaction resulting in energy transfer to lower and higher frequencies away from the peak forcing frequency, thereby increasing the infragravity wave height. At the beach, mainly longer infragravity waves are partly reflected to offshore direction, which in some cases leads to resonant amplification due to the reef's open basin geometry. Combined, these processes lead to a general decrease of sea swell wave energy in onshore direction, as well as a general increase in infragravity wave energy in onshore direction. A significant wave-induced setup and resulting mean water level on the reef flat are also present. For the study, we used the open source numerical model XBeach, which has been validated extensively on various reef coasts, including the measurements by Ford et al. in 2013. We set up the model by schematizing as cross-short reef transect by defining several components, namely the steep fore reef that starts in deep water and ends at the reef crest, which is the transition to the reef flat. The reef flat is the horizontal intertidal area of the reef. The excavation pit is located on this. The reef flat ends at the beach toe where the reef flat transitions into the beach. The beach is extended upwards to a fictitious elevation of 30 meters to make sure all wave runup is properly recorded. Then we generated a data set of more than 30,000 simulations by varying the reef submergence, for reef slope, the reef flat width, the beach slope, the pit width, the pit cross shore location, and the wave forcing conditions. 
when waves propagate to the near shore, they break at the wave crest and reduce in size. Their celerity is lower due to, in, due to decreased water depth. If a pit is included, as can be seen in this video, the wave speed increases locally. Moreover, there's also some wave reflection visible at the pit walls. And at the shoreline, in this case, shorter sea swell waves with a frequency higher than 0.04 hertz will increase in wave height at the shoreline. Additionally, there's a decrease in infragravity wave height at the shoreline. And combined, this leads to a total decrease in total wave height at the shoreline. Now, we've simulated over 30,000 combinations of various reefs, water levels, pit geometries, and forcing conditions to assess the impact of excavation pits at the shoreline in a more general sense. By combining all simulations in a single variance density spectrum, we clearly see that at the beach toe, most of the wave energy is in the infragravity band. Moreover, there are two peaks visible in the sea swell band, which originate from the peak forcing frequencies. Higher frequencies in the sea swell band are generally lower. From here, we distinguish the sea swell peak frequency band and the sea swell tail frequency band, denoted by SS peak and SS tail. In the second plot, we show the relative change in mean variance at the beach toe to, due to the presence of the pit. Again, plotting the entire data set averaged in one graph. We clearly see that there is a decrease in infragravity variance and an increase, no decrease in infragravity variance and a decrease in sea swell tail variance, while there is an increase in sea swell peak variance in the middle. For the wave heights, we observe similar results. Most simulations have a decrease in infragravity wave height and sea swell tail wave height, while the wave height in the SS peak band can either increase or decrease. Generally speaking, a pit causes a decrease of beach toe total wave height. And similarly, we see a small decrease in average water level at the beach toe. We found that these results are explained by arguing that a pit changes three main hydrodynamic mechanisms that occur on the reef. Firstly, the locally increased water depth of a pit results in reduced wave breaking of the peak for forcing frequencies, resulting in larger wave heights around these frequencies. Similarly, the increased water depth also reduces the triad wave wave interactions that redistribute the wave energy from the peak frequencies to the infragravity and the sea swell tail frequencies, thereby reducing the wave height in these frequencies. Lastly, there's partial wave reflection of the pit's wall, which mainly impacts longer infragravity waves. This significantly reduces the infragravity wave height at the beach toe. We also found indications that the decrease in infragravity wave energy could be due to the change in wave height around the natural frequencies of the reef, which results from a disruption of a quasi-standing wave pattern. We see that wide pits and pits located far from the beach toe are found to have a significant impact on the infragravity wave height at the beach toe, more than pits who are not as wide and located closer to the beach toe. And this is through a combination of partial wave transmission, changes in wave energy transfer, and the disruption of a quasi-standing wave pattern. Wider pits result in larger wave heights in both the SS peak and the SS tail bands compared to narrow pits, mainly due to less wave breaking and to a lesser extent due to lower transfer of wave energy from the SS to the infragravity band. Wave heights in the SS peak band are however, however more highly affected by changes in pit width than wave heights in the SS tail. This may be related to a combination of changes in wave dissipation and triad wave wave interactions. This is also supported by the change in mean variance at the waterline, where wider pits cause a larger increase in variance in the SS peak and decrease in variance in the SS tail bands. Due to infragravity dominance at the beach toe, the total wave height decreases for the majority of all the modeled reefs. Because of this, the impact of a reef of a pit is to decrease the wave run up in most cases, 87%. The remainder of the cases, 30%, experience an increase in runup due to the pit, which was most likely due to higher levels of wave energy in the SS peak band. This increase in SS peak wave energy could be caused by changes in wave dissipation and wave, wave interaction due to the presence of the pit. The probability of an increase in wave runup due to the presence of a pit is therefore low. However, it is generally increased for pits that are located closer to the beach toe or for pits that have a large width compared to the reef flat width. 
And finally, the results of the 2D model study. Um, the results of this 2D model show that there is a spatial variation of significant wave height around the excavation pit on the left and the variation in mean surface elevation on the right. The changes or decrease in significant wave height at the onshore side of the excavation pit result in a longshore varying wave-induced setup. Shoreward of the excavation pit, the resulting longshore mean water level gradients generate a mean depth average current on the right. These currents result in a net offshore directed depth average flow over the pit. This flow pattern may have a direct effect on the sediment dynamics over the reef flat, with the pit acting as a sediment trap for the longshore sediment transport. 1D model results suggest that this is a generic effect as pits cause a decrease in mean water level at the beach toe in nearly all cases. Moreover, model results indicate that the alongshore impact of the pit may be significantly larger than the extension of the pit itself. Thank you very much for listening. For any further questions, please write to claver.sabas at gmail.com.